Slinky says, "Now nah, I've had enough of this. I'm going to reboot." Um, I I was worrying that it might have been because this module is getting its power um, from the ignition coils. So there's a constant live. The coils are ground side switch, so the coils have all got lives to them, and then they're controlled with an earth. So and this module gets its power from the coils. And I was wondering whether actually it wasn't the module and it was something else funky going on with the bike. So I've shown. I'll show you a, a, a quick and dirty way I've eliminated the bike from this um, equation. Well, first things first. I've eliminated just one of the coils so the power commander the ignition module isn't controlling this coil now this this is coming straight from the bikes um, ECU and it's not going through the power commander so uh, I'm also going to back probe this um, with a light so I can see if it keeps its power when the engine stops so I've got I've got a test light just into this live on this coil uh, so we'll run it and we'll watch these lights and when it cuts out well when it cuts out, because this coil's been bypassed, theoretically it should still run on the rear cylinder, even though it's only got one of its two coils in operation. So let's uh, let's start it up and see what happens. Actually, I've got to I've got to turn the ignition off. Let the power go away. Let this module reboot. And it should oh, it's having a fit already. It hasn't even. Let's see if it'll run. One cylinder. It's kept its power. Right. So stop that. So I'm I'm confident it's not the bike. It's definitely something to do with this module. Now there's a story. Um, I didn't supply these the power commander, the ignition module, and the auto tune. The customer did, and he, thinking back, and I've just actually had a conversation with him. He brought me some other bits for the bike, the cruise control, and the ignition module. Uh, and then a couple of days later he dropped off the power commander and the auto tune and now if you know anything about these you'll know that they're all on the same network um, which is what these cables are they're all sort of piggybacked they're on a, like a CAN bus network and they've all got to be set up at the same time so you've got to make sure they've got the same firmware on them and they've all got to be added to the network so I suspect we'll plug in in, in a minute and we'll we'll have a look and see I, I think probably going to end up with different firmware on this and it's also not been added to the network properly and I'm hoping that is all the problem is so switch over to the power commander software now on the laptop and uh, or on the computer and we'll see what's going on right so it turns out that they did actually have the the same version of firmware on the ignition module on the power commander 5 um, lots of to and fro in and going round in circles um, communication with the customer and with Dynajet. Dynajet suggested that I install an earlier version of the firmware on the ignition module and the Power Commander 5 um, which made absolutely no difference so rather than bore you to death with lots of PC screen grab stuff that's where we ended up. So for now I'm just going to um, I've got these two obviously the ignition module's gone now I've got these two uh, sticky tape together bloody what's the word U UHB what the fuck USB oh my head's gone with this bike bloody um, VHB fucking hell thank you um, so the VHB together and I've just got them packed in there with a little bit of foam point the camera in the right direction Jim they're packed in there with a little bit of foam for now because as we need to what am I trying to say with this auto tune the Tell you what I'll do. I'll I'll do a screen grab of my laptop. I wasn't going to do it, but I'll I'll show you a, a little bit about how this um, auto tune works with the software. And basically, I'm going to need to plug into the USB port of the Power Commander Five until it's built the map that we want, and it's all set in stone. This is going to need to come in and out a few times. Once it's we've got the map we want, which you're not going to see because the customer is going to do that. We can attach this in a more permanent way. Probably there's a little pl flat plastic plate under here. Um, so I'm going to VHB tape this down onto that, pack some foam around it, probably make it a little bit more permanent. But just for now, while we're making a map, that's fine. Anyway, I'll show you this software. 
okey cokey so we've got this just pulled out USB in here and then I'll walk you through this Power Commander software and the auto-tune just a very basic explanation of what's going on just because some of you might find it interesting there's like a million people on YouTube way better at this stuff than I am um, in terms of dyno tuning or oh, it's not dyno tuning but in terms of tuning these things um, I've got a good enough understanding of it but there are experts out there that dedicate their lives to it so if you're really interested in this subject go and search them out on the interweb right okay so I'm going to do my best to try and not waffle myself to death here with this because um, I'm in danger of that's what's going to happen right so hold your horses uh, let's open this power commander software right so no devices connected uh, let's put this bad boy in uh, if you can find the USB port. Okay. So, the ignition of the bike is off at the moment. Right, so we've got one device connected. Now then, uh, we, we've not got two devices. Obviously, there's two devices here. There's an auto-tune and a power commander. The auto-tune needs the bike to be on because it's powered separately. So we should get two devices. Yes, right, let me just explain what's going on. Hopefully you'll be able to see my cursor. So on the left hand side here is what is described as the tree and it's what I call it. Um, and there's various different stuff. I'm, I can feel myself wanting to waffle already. So we've got prim primary module, which is the Power Commander 5 itself, which is the thing that's connected, physically connected to the bike's injectors. And underneath that we've got the auto tune. I just want to, let's do the primary, primary module first just quickly. See we've got cylinder 1 and cylinder 2 and underneath that we've got fuel, ignore fuel pressure. So if I click on fuel and I, I click get map, so that's reading the fuel map for cylinder 1 and if I click on that on cylinder 2 and click get map, that reads the fuel map for that cylinder. Now if you notice, they're slightly different. Um, whoops. It's because of cylinder temperature and things like that. Anyway, so this is what what you would consider the stock map that Di that Dynajet blah, 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 that Dynajet provide with this um, with this Power Commander Five for this model. Um, actually, technically, that's not true because this has come from Rottweiler Performance, so this is their map. But anyway, I digress. Um, what we're looking at here, if you look down the left hand side 500 750 000, 1250 that's the rpm that's the rpm of the engine and then along the top we have the percentage so full throttle is 100 percent zero throttle is idle um okay so what we've got here is these numbers 10 to there 10 10 10 that is a percentage okay how to explain this Without the power commander on, this bike runs, it's injecting fuel, it runs perfectly. So, where there's a zero, the Dynajet power commander isn't going to make any adjustment to the fuel. Where there's a positive number, i.e. this 10 here, it's going to add 10% more fuel at that point. So at 2,500 RPM on a 40% throttle, it's going to be injecting 10% more fuel, if that makes sense. And then if we go down here at 6,000 RPM at... 60% throttle it's going to be um, injecting 17% more fuel anyway that makes sense I'm sure now then where the auto tune comes in this is a very basic map here so if we go to um, see we've got auto tune here in the in the in the tree um, and we go to target AFR now then these are not percentage numbers these are air fuel ratio numbers so without wanting to get myself right down a rabbit hole with this and again you can go and find this stuff out yourself if you're really interested in it there's a thing called stoichiometric which is how to put this simply if you've got 14.7 pounds of fuel and a pound of air by weight you will get the perfect or chemically speaking you'll get the perfect burn um, so 14.7 is stoichiometric now generally speaking if you speak to somebody that knows more about this than me maximum power is gener generated sort of just below stoichiometric so the slightly rich side of stoichiometric um, 
but that's still really too lean for a modern engine um, for any sort of longevity of the exhaust valves overheating and things so they tend to run them a little bit richer again so these are air fuel ratio numbers so 13.4 to 1 so on and so forth so what happens is when the engine's running the wide band O2 sensors in the exhaust that we welded in they will measure the air fuel ratio and at these specific throttle openings and RPM so 4500 there 60% throttle it will be trying to adjust the fuel air ratio the air fuel ratio to 13.4 I was going to say percent that's not right 13 foot 13 the blimey Jim let me start again so at 4500 rpm at 60% throttle it will be trying to get the air fuel ratio to 13.4 so if it sees that it's richer than that it will take fuel away and if it sees it's leaner than that it will add fuel and what it will do it will dump it because there's a, there's a sensor for each exhaust for each cylinder so there's two trim tabs here what will happen is as we run the bike we'll start to see numbers um, in in these places so if it's added or taken away fuel as it's been running we'll get positive or negative numbers here and then what we can do we can go to if I find it in the right menu so we can go to power commander tools oh, hang on a minute um, auto tune tables and then we can accept all trims and what that does is the learnt behavior is then saved um, to the main the main fuel map if that makes sense oh blimey that was so it will be saved to these these two these two trim that trim table there for cylinder one if there's changes here we'll save it to that fuel map and if there's any adjustment that it's made when it's been running in that one it will be saved to that map and then we'll run it again and it'll start tuning itself again and we'll see we'll see less change the second or third time we run it um, there's like a gazillion more things to discuss about it but I'm not getting into it because that's not really what this is this video is about I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview anyway road test next uh, you'll probably get a little bit of that I might film myself road testing it I'm really interested to see whether this cruise control works um, might even turn into a four-part video of this we'll see anyway thanks guys fingers crossed all seems to be well So all that remains now, put the bodywork back on, give it a road test and uh, see if we can have a massive accident with this cruise control. Happy days. Right out guys, cross your fingers for me. And we're off. Shaky camera or oh, vibrate camera. Hopefully that's coming out all right. We'll go up onto the uh, main road and see if this cruise control works. Be interesting when we get back to see Remember that time I nearly crashed into those horses on this corner? Do you remember that video? Hayabusa, I think it was. Um, be interesting to see, have a look at the auto-tune map when we get back and see... God, this camera is... Oh God, I hope I can use this footage. It's shaking like a bugger. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what that auto-tune is doing. When we get back, we'll plug the uh, tablet in and have a look.
Turn the cruise on and push the button. Ah, oh, it's working! The bloody cruise is working! Right, touch the brakes. Yes, and it kills it. Oh, resume speed, that works. Okay. Look, guys, we're riding along, right? I don't know where you're going to get this. Hang on. Look, no hands! Cruise control is working! It's actually... Quite fun that it's weird having cruise on a bike it's kind of well for you people that ride touring bikes maybe not but for me I'm a, I'm a sports bike kind of a guy so cruise is not really a not really a thing this road's a bit smoother you might get a better better video on here Whoa, she's got some beans fair news Lift that front wheel. Goes like a train. Interestingly, let me see while I while I stop now, hang on, let me try and bring that camera down now. You can watch that uh That AFR change as I ride. Okay then guys, let's have a quick look. <coughs> what have we got there? Two devices connected. Let's have a quick look and see. So if I, if I click get map. We can see the changes it's made. Not a great deal to be fair. So we've got a minus one here, minus one there. It's taken a little bit of fuel away. Uh, so these are the... I mean I've literally only ridden it around the block. So it doesn't have a lot of time to make a lot of changes and then this one very hang on a minute cylinder two get map very very similar slightly different in this area here where we sort of seven thousand revs so it's leaned it off slightly in the middle um, what I didn't mention because I didn't really want to get in, into it too much when we were looking at the other map is I'm not so sure this target AFR map See how this is all zero, um, up to 20% throttle, right the way up to 6,500 RPM. I'm not sure that uh, that target AFR is going to be quite right for this. They do suffer with some sort of drivability, rideability issues at small throttle openings, so I'm not sure whether there's a better target AFR map for this. Um, but anyway, we can see, I just wanted to show you that, we can see some slight changes to the map starting to happen. And then if we wanted to, um, if we go to, we can accept all trims now, that was greyed out before. Um, I'm not going to touch it though, I want, I want to build a bit of a map there so the customer can see it's working before we actually accept the changes. But anyway, that is the end now. Uh, thank you guys, this has been a long-winded uh, job this. See you on the other side. Oh, there's one more thing, sir. One other thing. Ah. One more thing. Uh, one thing. Just one more thing, please. Oh, one more thing. Oh, just one more thing, sir. Uh, one more thing, sir. I almost forgot. Uh, that's very hard for me to understand. Okay, guys, so after watching that last section of video of me actually fixing the bike you're probably all thinking well uh, yeah that's great Jim you fixed it but we really don't understand what the fuck is going on um 
and I agree, it's a little bit disjointed. Um, and it's because there's some of the fix I didn't actually film. There was there was a section which was me looking at the CAN network with my oscilloscope. Um, and you kind of need to understand what went on there. So this is after the fact. This is the following day after the fix. Um, I'm just tidying up a few loose ends to make it all coherent so you know what's going on. So bear with me. I'll try not go down a massive rabbit hole. I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of what's been going on and then you can understand the fix and what caused it to go wrong in the first place. So we're looking at the um, diagnostic machine here, obviously. I just wanted to give you a tiny bit of a background on CAN networks, which is something you see on modern cars and motorcycles. So a CAN network is a means of connecting lots of different components um, of the motorcycle. So rather than there being lots of wires and lots of you know current flow through the wiring loom where different parts of the bike are talking to each other, they do it digitally through a CAN network. So if you look on this diagram here, so see we've got chassis control. Actually, let me go back one. See these green wires? Um, these green wires here are, this is the CAN network, CAN low and CAN high. So these green wires are connecting the chassis management control unit. They're connecting up here. Uh, that is the engine management. That's the fuel injection control unit. That's instrument panel. That's the diagnostic socket, which is where the offending article, the cruise control, plugs into the CAN network on these two green wires here. And what else have we got there? We've got um, electronic control there. I mean, this one, I'm not sure why it doesn't light up. That is, if we go back out of here and we go to petrol injection and go to this diagram, that's this module here, um, engine management control unit. And then as you can see, chassis management there, same thing, different diagram obviously, but diagnostic socket again, you get the idea. So this network <coughs> consists of two wires. So they're... Uh, can low and can high, which I think I just said already. They're normally a twisted pair, and we might get to why they're twisted together later on, but not just at this point, because I don't want to waffle on and on. So this network networks all these different components together. Now, they talk using a pulse width modulated signal, so I don't want to get too geeky on you. Um, so this we're looking at now, this is um, a Pico scope. So this is a, a lot of you have seen me use my Snap-on Vantage Pro, which is an oscilloscope, a two-channel oscilloscope, which is a great thing to sort of have out in the wild, you know, groveling around in the dirt kind of thing. Well, this is a PC-based uh, oscilloscope, which is way more powerful, but a little bit more finicky to use. It's the sort of thing you only really use when you're in the workshop, not out in the wild. So if I go to, we look at this. So this is what a CAN network signal looks like. Now, I don't want to I could go off on one about this. This is a subject you could literally lose yourself in this subject for weeks um, if you wanted to. I, don't, I just want to give you a very basic background for people that don't understand what's going on. So these two traces, the blue and the red, those are the two wires, if you like, on the bike, the can low and can high. Can high is the blue, can low is the, um, the red. Now if you look on this scale down here on the left hand side, there's zero volts where my cursor is. So on um, on this the blue trace we're looking at. So can high signal it goes from 2.5 to 3.5 volts. So it's basically an on-off signal between well not it doesn't go off, it, it just changes between 2.5 and 3.5 volts up and down, on and off. And then the can low signal, again if we go over to the right hand side, the scale for this one is over on this side. This goes from 1.5 to 2.5. Now if we zoom in, so if we go on there and we zoom in, if you notice the signals, they're a mirror image of each other. So when can high, the blue one goes positive, the, or when the voltage increases, it, it doesn't ever go negative because they're both positive signals, but when the can high goes goes to a higher voltage, the can low goes to a low voltage and they're an exact mirror image of each other. And that is because, and we're getting down a rabbit hole here, that is because they're a twisted pair. And you know when we talked about in the 
I don't know whether some of you may not have seen it, but it's basic physics. When you pass a magnetic field over a wire, it creates um, current flow and voltage. So basically, how to say, how to explain this easily? Electromagnetic interference. So basically, magnetism through through the atmosphere. When the magnetism passes over this wire, it would change. It would induce current flow in, in these two wires. And the idea of this is to, um, when you get interference on can low or can high, it, you get the same opposite effect on the other can wire and they cancel each other out. So it's a way of avoiding electromagnetic interference because on a bike, you can imagine you've got things like ignition coils um, making huge amounts of and they're suppressed massively to try and stop them from creating electromagnetic interference but nonetheless it's a pretty harsh environment um for this type of system so this makes it quite robust you can get um single wire um can this there's single wire can systems and there's K-Line and there's Lin bus and there's all sorts of different stuff if you want to go and research them. A lot of them not used on bikes. You can have single wire systems which aren't as robust and they tend to use those systems on things like sort of non-safety critical stuff like uh, audio systems and it, like for a car you'd probably see it on central locking and some sort of interior lights and all those sort of weird things that aren't really safety critical and don't need to be super fast. And then again, I'm not going to get into it, but you can have, there are different speeds of CAN networks. Single wire CAN networks are like 30 kilobits a second and 250 kilobits a second, 500 kilobits a second. And they're all, um, how do you put it? They're all graded. Um, anyway, it doesn't, I don't want to go down that, down that hole. So anyway, this is the CAN signal. So, what was wrong with this bike? Let's get to the bloody point, Jim. When I plugged in, here's the crux of it, okay? When I plugged in the, um, what's the name? When I plugged in the cruise control to this connector here, the diagnostic socket, for some reason, I would get a, obviously it's talking the CAN language, this cruise control, I would get a higher amplitude signal, which would sort of just overwrite all the, the, the information on the CAN network, which was why I was getting CAN network fault codes. And it would last for about five seconds, and then it would find its place in the world in the CAN network and, and seem to work okay. It was initially when it was being plugged in. I have absolutely no idea why. I'm just, I'm not technical enough to give you a... a real explanation um, as to why maybe somebody out there that's cleverer than me could explain why but what appears to have happened is with these KTM ECUs it's possible to reset the ECU in the diagnostic software and I, I haven't got it plugged into the bike at the moment so I can't I can't actually show you how to do that but in one of the menus there's a there's a engine management control unit reset and when you reset the engine management control unit one of the things you have to do is you have to reinitialize the neutral switch. I didn't know this. This is every day is a school day. Um, so when you reset the, because I've reset ECUs on 990s and never had to do this. Um, so you reset the ECU on a KTM and then there's an, there's an ECU initialization process, which normally involves starting the bike and leaving it idle on a closed throttle for a period of time. Um, so this morning I've again I've I, I wanted to make sure that I'd reset the ECU properly. So I I I won't go into the details. I, I went through the reset procedure. The ECU's been reset, um, which meant I then had to reinitialize the neutral light again, and everything worked perfectly. So the issue has been let me summarize. The issue was we plugged in the cruise control into the CAN network. And we got a high amplitude signal, so a higher voltage um, on can high and con low, which is basically a load of noise over the top of the signal that was already there. And for some reason, it's caused the engine management unit to reset, which then meant I had to go in and reinitialize the neutral light. 
very very or the ignition um, gear position switch so that's basically what's happened um, let me just go back I, I, I feel a waffle I want to talk about CAN networks um, when you've got all these different modules talking on the network I just want to give you a little bit of extra information if you are interested when you've got all these modules talking on the network if you can imagine they're all the way a CAN network works is the way a CAN network works the way a CAN network works is they're all talking on the network at the same time. So every module on this network, they're all putting information onto the network at the same time. And if you could imagine, if there wasn't some sort of hierarchy, they'd all just talk over the top of one another. So there is a part of the CAN signal that each of these modules puts out. There's a, what's the word? Uh... It's called, um, bear with me, brain work. It's called signal arbitration in CAN speak. And what it means is different modules are sort of higher or lower in the pecking order. So, for example, the... Oh, I'm going on and on, aren't I, with this? So, for example, the ABS signal would probably be highest priority because it's got, if you look down here, it's got the wheel speed sensors going into the ABS module. That wheel speed sensor information, so the speed the wheels are turning at, is being broadcast on this CAN network. That information is obviously used for ABS, but it's also used for traction control by the um, petrol injection system. So if you want to reduce power because you're starting a wheel spin or something, then that information is super critical. So that's like number one in the pecking order. So anyway, what I was trying to say is, there's, a, there's an order of importance for each of these modules, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add that little snippet of information in there. Um, right, so that's it. To summarise the... I think, and I've already done a summary, haven't I? It's the, it Basically, it's the cruise control causing a load of noise on the CAN network, causing this engine management control unit to, to reset itself, which then meant... The and it's always simple, isn't it? When you find the fault, it meant that the neutral light needed to be, or the gear position switch needed to be reinitialized, which is news to me because I've reset ECUs on these KTM's before, uh, not on 1190s to be fair, on 990s, like I said, and I've never had that problem. They are. That's the fix. Anyway, thanks guys. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a massive waffle, and there's some information in there that you find interesting. Cool. See you on the other side.